Would you ask Mr. Williams to come back in, please? Thank you. Right, Mr. Williams, ready to carry on? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Millett. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Williams, um, we were looking uh, at the letter which went out to David Amos under your hand on the 16th of May 2014 before we broke. Um, now, before you sent that letter, um, Brian Martin had drafted you a submission. Let's look at it. It's at CLG 301295. There it is. It's from Brian Martin, 13th of May 2014, addressed to you. Uh, do you remember reading it at the time? Yes. You do. Good. Now, um, if we look at the first issue there, it says, Issue. David Amos, Chairman of the All-Party Parliamentary Fire Safety and Rescue Group, has written to you in response to your letter to the Honorary Secretary of the group. The group have argued that a review of approved document B should be brought forward and have invited you to meet with them. Uh, and then under the recommendation, it says this, that on this occasion you decline, in bold, the invitation. Did you meet Brian Martin and discuss this submission with him? Uh, pr probably not, um, is, is the answer to that. Um, again, I'm, try I'm trying to avoid giving you long, long answers, but a little bit of context here. Again, I have a minister's office works. We've covered correspondence. These are, this is invites. Ministers are bombarded with invitations to meet, not, not just from members of the public and lobbyists and so on, but from other members of parliament as well. The default position is to decline and to re reject the interview, uh, the, 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 uh, the invitation. So when I saw this, I would not have thought it unusual to initially decline the invitation. I would have signed the decline letter um, without giving it that much thought because I'd, I'd turned down lots of other meetings with people about a myriad of issues prior to this. So while, while in isolation, you might indeed wonder why did I agree to decline the invitation? Well, that was the normal practice. I see. So but I, I, as I'm sure we'll come on to, that changed. So you didn't ask him, why am I declining this invitation? Um, I don't think I did um, because it was <coughs> routine to turn down uh, meeting requests with ministers. I mean, ministers have a pretty jam-packed diary, so the um, number of um, reactive invitations that you, that you accept obviously has to be limited. Now, if we look at paragraph three under background, it says this. The current edition of approved document B was published in 2006. Since then, the department has been regularly lobbied to instigate another review or make specific amendments. A common call is to extend the provisions for sprinkler protection. Yeah. Following the Lacknell House fire, the coroner criticised the complexity of the guidance in approved document B and called on the government to revise it. The Secretary of State rejected this, but did commit to a review, which would deliver a, re a revised document in 2016-17. Preliminary work is now underway. Now, just pausing there, were you aware at this time that the last major review of approved document B had taken place in 2006, and that was for the version published in the April of 2007? Sorry, was I aware prior to receiving this submission? Were you aware at this time, seeing this document, before seeing this document? Uh, almost certainly not. Right. Did you consider at the time that, uh, that a decade between major reviews of the associated guidance uh, on fire safety in the building regulations was uh, adequate? Um, well, this, this, you know, this is not a detailed policy submission. This, this, this is uh, something the diary secretary, one of the, one of the four private secretaries, would have gone through with me reject, 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 and I probably just signed the letter and saw the recommendation was not not to have a meeting, and I don't think uh, there would have been a deep thought process as to why the meeting request was being declined. I see. Did that tell us that you would get, you look at the issue on this piece of paper, you'd look at recommendation, see the word decline in bold, and not really look at the rest? No, I wouldn't assume that. Um, it's a very short submission, so the chances are I read all of it, and of course, I was aware of these issues. I mean, in the, in the pre-lunch session, we've you know, we've discussed the coroner's letter uh, and uh, the response from from the department already. So I was aware of the background. Uh, I was aware of the existence of the 
of 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 David Amos and uh, and Ronnie King. Um, so I wouldn't have given that much further thought to it. Right. Now, um, in relation to paragraph four there, and the part I read to you at the end, preliminary work is now underway. In your second witness statement, we don't need to go to it, it's page six and page seven, paragraph 13 there, that, and as you say, you weren't, a, you weren't provided with any further information which would have enabled me to have a more detailed understanding of what exactly the preliminary work was. Is that right? That was right at this stage, but I know okay. what, what the next document is likely in your sequence. Uh, that, that changed very, uh, fairly quickly after this. Right. Well, at this stage, before we look ahead too far, did you not think to ask Mr. Martin what is the preliminary work that is now underway? No, but then I'm being assured that um, work is underway in 2014 to deliver something by 2017. At that stage, I, I'm just thinking you know, what my thought process would have been at, at the time. To be told three years before something that the preliminary work is underway is, is, you know, is hardly surprising in, in any sense. Um, so I, I might have thought, <laughs> I, I, I can't be sure eight, eight, eight years on, the, that it was reasonable to decline the invitation because at that stage we were in the very early stages of preparing for, for the review of the document. Right. Um, well, in the middle of that paragraph, you see it says, the Secretary of State rejected this, and that's the call on the government to revise approved document B. D was that your understanding, that the Secretary of State, Eric Pickles, had rejected the coroner's recommendation to revise approved document B? It's, read it, reading it now boldly, it's, it's a slightly contradictory paragraph, isn't it? Because the first sentence says, the Secretary of State rejected the recommendation to revise it, and then it says the Secretary did commit to a review which would deliver a revised document. Well, if you've revised the document, then you've clearly gone through a process of revision. So, so um, it's a slightly schizophrenic um, paragraph, but all I imagine I drew from that at the time was we are going to do something in response to the coroner's letter. The Secretary of State has already said what it's going to be. The preliminary work for that is now underway. So meeting someone with a concern about it at this stage, it's reasonable to say no. You know, maybe in six months' time, um, if that letter, had, if, if this request had come in, I'd have said, well, it's entirely reasonable to meet with him now. I'm really just trying to understand <clears throat> what your thoughts were at the time about whether or not Eric Pickles had or hadn't rejected the coroner's recommendation to revise approved document B. Now, here we see a record of the fact, as it is said, that he rejected it. My question is, is that something you knew at the time? Um, we've already had, had a discussion about the window competent persons scheme. Well, I, I, I think similar wording would have been uh, uh, in that document that the Secretary of State had it, 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 it's a bit, looking at it now, it's a bit difficult to understand what, what, what this means because he clearly hadn't rejected, you, you must ask him about it, I'm sure you will, he, he clearly hadn't rejected out of hand the principle of revising Part, part B um, and indeed work, work was underway and he had set a timetable for publishing a, a revised document. It, 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 it's a bit to be, to be honest, Chairman, it's quite a poorly worded paragraph. But did you ask me? But, but, but I'm saying that now. I don't know whether I thought at the time this is a poorly worded paragraph. Well, if you'd read it at the time, is there any reason I why I did you read would... it at the time. If there, if, well, if you read it at the time, why did you not ask Mr. Martin, what does this mean? I don't understand this paragraph. Could you explain it to me, please? Yeah, that, that, that's a perfectly fair question. Um, I, I suppose I could have done. But uh, as I said, the context of this is that Every Wednesday morning, I've, I've explained already that, that we had this, this prayers meeting. What happened in my private office immediately afterwards, or in the next hour or so, was that the diary secretary would sit down with me and one, go through everything that I was going to be doing in, in, in the next week, but also go through all the invitations where the advice was to accept or decline. And obviously it was open to me to overturn 
in either direction, because you know, I didn't want to see someone. Ultimately, it was up to me that even if they said I should see them, that <clears throat> perhaps I might not want to. Um, so I, it is impossible for me to know now how many diary invitations, Robert was his name, uh, would have gone through with me on on whatever Wednesday was in, in that week. It may have been you know, quite a few others. But as I said, the, the routine thing anyway was to decline the invitation. Okay. Um, if we look at the submission at the foot of the page, if we scroll down, please, it says, consideration, the department has been very clear on its position in relation to sprinklers and to the next review of approved document B. Bringing this review forward would require the allocation and reallocation of resources and it is unlikely that the new evidence would justify any significant change against the government's regulatory policies. As such, we recommend that you decline to meet on this occasion. Did you read that paragraph? Yes, I would have done, but I'm not sure it, you know, it changes what I've already said to you. It was a, it was a diary request. and well, Just uh, take it I, in stages. You read the paragraph, yes? I, 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 I assume that I did, yes. Right. Uh, what, therefore, was your understanding when you read this paragraph of what the words uh, requiring the allocation and reallocation of resources meant? Well, I hadn't met everybody in the building regulations team because there were several parts that I never dealt with in the time that I was a minister. But you know, I think it would have been reasonable for me to assume that there, was, there were dedicated officials to each, each part of, of, of the building regulations uh, through, I think, to part... P at, at, at the time, and other streams of work were ongoing. So we're in mid-2014. I knew at that point, because I was heavily involved in it, that there was an enormous piece of work on the Housing Standards Review, which was drawing to a conclusion. In fact, I think it was concluded more or less at this time, and a lot of officials were working on that project. The next big thing that was coming down the tracks was was the drafting of the legislate well the agreement first of all for zero carbon homes to be in the Queen's speech, which I think is pretty simultaneous with this submission, and that, as I said, I think in the first session, Chairman, this morning, was what Nick Clegg said to me was my number one <coughs> priority as the Liberal Democrat Minister in that department to deliver the zero carbon homes <coughs> legislation, and that would require. Uh, you know, a lot of official time. Given that the time frame for doing those two things was by effectively March 2015, when the coalition government, because of the Fixed Term Parliament Act, was coming to an end, then that's what I would have understood by that, that officials are allocated to these big chunks of work. Part B revision is scheduled to come after that. Moving people off, off those programmes now would quite obviously, disrupt work that was currently underway. And these, you know, th th those weren't trivial issues, as not as if I was being asked to substitute uh, an important thing for a less important thing. Um, they, they, they were important pieces of work. Can you tell us why there's no mention in this briefing note uh, of any uh, external fire spread or guidance about the refurbishment of older housing stock uh, which are the matters which the coroner, as I showed you this morning, had recommended? Uh, uh, well, to sh short answer, no, but clearly I'm not okay. in a position to tell you why something isn't in a submission. Uh, and again, when you saw this submission and the reference in the first paragraph that you'd been written to, uh, did you not want to see the letter so that you could understand the submission in full? Um, we're in danger of repeating ourselves here, Chairman. This, this was a diary. So the answer is no. The, the, no, because right. this, this submission, the submission is almost the wrong word for it. it, it it's a diary request issue. It's, 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 not, it's, it's, not, it's not a submission about going into an in-depth policy discussion. It's, it's do you meet this person, yes or no? And there were lots of people who I did meet who I personally may not have want to have met, but the advice was to meet them. And uh, equally, there were, there were lots of meetings where the advice was to decline. This, this was you know, routine. There's nothing extraordinary about it. Now, in fact, it's right, isn't it, that you didn't, in the end, decline to meet the APBG, but uh, confirmed your attendance with them on the 17th of June. Has yeah, I, can I tell you the back, how that happened? Uh, yes, please. Uh, David, when he got the rejection letter, uh, came up to me uh, while voting 
and said, Stephen, I'm very disappointed that you've refused to meet me. Um, uh, can you have a rethink? And I said, well, why? Well, what do you want to talk about? And he told me about sprinklers and whatever. And I said, OK, I'll go back and tell officials that we'll have a meeting. As I said, I, I liked David Amos. We oppose each other on virtually everything. He's an Essex boy, Eurosceptic, who opposed same-sex marriage, was a Thatcherite Tory, nothing in common. But personally, we got on, and, and you know, we liked each other. So he, this is a good example of why voting in person is, is good for Parliament, because it enables backbench MPs to literally grab hold of ministers uh, and say, can I collar you about this? Uh, and this is one of those occasions. So I went back to the whenever it was, probably the next day, because that would have been late at night, uh, and said to um, either Kerr or Robert, the diary secretary, actually, uh, <coughs> go back to the officials and say, we're going to meet them after all. And that's how the meeting was set up. Now, in your statement, you say, and this is your second statement to paragraph 25, we don't need to go to it, that you, <coughs> you wanted to meet him uh, and reassure him that his views were taken into account. You also say the meeting, in fact, lasted uh, a maximum of 30 minutes. Is mm. that right? Yes, that's my recollection. Right. But again, that is routine. Me meetings with ministers were nearly always around about 30 minutes. Right. And would you say from those two meetings, or the one that lasted no more than 30 minutes, that you had an in-depth conversation with David Amos about his specific concerns... Well, there's a, there's a subsequent submission to, to the document that's on screen at the moment, which, which the front page is largely the same, apart from it takes out the decline of the meeting. And on the reverse, uh, it, it says these are the topics that we would expect <coughs> you to discuss. Um, lines to take, I think it's almost certainly called. So I would have... My recollection of the meeting is that, which was in a committee room on the top floor of Parliament, is that after the preliminary niceties, David would have said, Minister, thank you for coming. Tell us, uh, you know, tell, tell us what's going on in your department. You know our concerns. And I would have worked my way through uh, those issues, which, which are in the subsequent uh, submission. And at that point, I think David said, thank you, and handed over to Ronnie King and said, Ronnie will now ask some questions. And my recollection is that Brian answered those rather than me. Now, let's go to your second statement, please, page 13. This is uh, CLG 304921, page uh, 13, paragraph 26. You say, although I would not have said it out loud, I also knew that, that the time for making policy decisions about the outcome of the review would be after my time as minister in the department. I recall thinking that I'd given Mr. Amos and the APPG an opportunity to make his points in person <coughs> to both me and the relevant policy officials. Um, what was the point of letting Mr. Amos and the APPG make their points to you if you had no intention of doing anything about them? I think that's um, it's a bit rude, to be honest. Um, that was certainly not the... Uh, not, not my, my um, thoughts at the time uh, at all. I, I gave David an opportunity to, to make his points, although most of them, as I say, were in fact made by Ronnie King, not, not David, um, because I thought it was important for them to have an opportunity to air their views. He, he was clearly frustrated that he felt he'd been ignored. I gave him the opportunity face-to-face -to, -face to have a meeting not only with the minister, but with the relevant official as well, the review itself would be led by the evidence that came in, some of it from the building research establishment, some, as I'm sure, will come to from, from other sources, and opinions from, the, from David and Ronnie would be in that mix, but you know, they, weren't, they weren't the trump card. Well, let me put it differently, since uh, uh, it perhaps... Let me put it differently. You say, I wouldn't have said it out loud, I knew the time for making policy decisions about the outcome of the re review would be after my time as minister. Well, why, why not say it out loud? Um, well, David and I both, both knew that. We, we knew yes. he probably voted against the Sixth Term Parliament Act, actually. But we both knew that whatever happened, that government was going to end with the, with the dissolving of Parliament in, in March 2015. So we're what are we, nine months roughly away from that uh, at this particular point in time, the review timetable was to have a, a fresh document 
whether you call it revised or, or, or whatever, in place, as I understood it, by 31st of March 2017. So quite clearly, the, the lion's share of, of, of that work was going to be done after March 2015, when yeah. even the most optimistic of, of cephologists were not expecting uh, the coalition to continue beyond that point. So, you know, yeah. I'm an optimistic person, but I wasn't that optimistic that I would still be in office throughout 2015 and 2016. So it was the purpose of the meeting essentially to receive from the APPG what they wanted to tell you so that you would act essentially as a channel to the officials in your department who would be staying on beyond 2015. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's right. a perfectly fair summary of what I, I wanted to achieve on David's behalf. I see. And did you therefore expect Brian Martin or, and others in the department to take responsibility uh, for receiving what David Amos told you and moving forward with them? Yes. Yes. Were you aware that Brian Martin did not regard the promise made by Eric Pickles to the, se to the coroner that he'd made in May 2013 about uh, producing a new version of ADB in 2016 to 17 as an absolute commitment? No. He didn't? He never, he, he uh, no, he, uh, I can definitively say, even with the elapse of time since then, that he never said anything that closely resembles even that phrase? Uh, yeah, there is a document, and that's why I used it. Yeah, but it's not a document that I would have seen. No, no, I'm not suggesting it is. I'm just I'm asking you whether, in fact, you ever knew that Brian Martin's view uh, was that the undertaking given by the Secretary of State to the coroner in May 2013 was not an absolute commitment. No, I wasn't, but if, I mean, if you think about that, it would have been, Chairman, quite extraordinary for an official to say to, albeit a minister from a different party, that I do not agree with the Secretary of State's decision. And that, as candid as I encouraged officials to be with me, that would have been way overstepping the mark, I think, if he'd said that, and he didn't. Now, let's go to CLG 1006341. This is... Uh a further submission to you, which you rightly predicted, uh, dated the 11th of June 2014. It's from Brian Martin to you. Mm -hmm. You can see the date there. Copy to all ministers, uh, as well as Bob Leadsom and Louise Upton, issue. Uh, and it says here, David Amos, chairman of the APPG, has invited you to attend a meeting of the group to discuss the timing of the review of Part B, fire safety of the building's regulations. Lines to take are at flag A. Yeah. Uh, and if we look down the page, we can see that what is written there <clears throat> largely uh, replicates uh, what was in the submission I showed you before. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's the other side of the page that's more relevant, yeah. Uh, right. Um, and then let's go to page two. Um, flag A, lines to take. C can I take it you read this document? Absolutely. Of course I did, yeah. Um, and it says, what's happening with Part B of the regulations... Four, four bullet points, I'll read them to you. Following the Lackland House fire, the coroner called on the government to simplify the guidance in approved document B. The Secretary of State committed to re a review which would deliver a revised document in 2016 to 17. The intention being to simplify the guidance where possible and to update and revise the technical content at the same time. Preliminary work leading to that publication has already started. A review of such an important document is significant activity and covers a wide range of complex issues and conflicting views. This is not something that can be done overnight. The department has commissioned the building research establishment to look at seven work streams. These are all complex issues and BRE are fully engaged with industry experts and other partners. And then you've got seven bullet points there. Let's just look at them. One, periods of fire resistance. Two, maximum fire compartment sizes. Three, construction details. Four, fire protection of basements and basement car parks. Five, strict sprinkler provision. Six, space separation. Seven, means for, of escape for disabled people. Um, first, what, what work leading to the publication of revised <coughs> um, ADB had been started? as at June 2014. Um, I, I assume what is covered in uh, bullet point four that you just read out, the points one to seven. Now I know from the pre-lunchtime session, you revealed to me that in fact, uh, this, this work had started before the coroner's 
letter. I did not know that, so I would have taken at face <coughs> value that this this was the work that was underway. And by by this stage, I knew what the VRE was. Um, can't be sure the exact date, but it's possible I had been there by then as well. I certainly went there in mid 2014 and spent a full day right. with them. So I knew, I knew the bona fides, as it were, of of, of the BRE. Right, right. Did you? Um, so, did you think, looking at this, that the department's commissioning of these seven work streams was a response to the coroner's recommendation? Well, I, well, well, I probably did, and that would have been a reasonable assumption given the way that the the the, the lines to take. Are written. I had certainly had no reason to suppose otherwise. Um, Were you aware that none of these work streams dealt with the with external fire spread or the refurbishment of older housing stock? No. Um, let, let let me explain to you. We've gone through how, how a diary session works. For a meeting with somebody, what would have happened was, and this would be the same for any meeting with you know, anybody, including an official, that this brief would have gone in my box probably 48 hours before, so I, I would have read it late, late one night uh, <coughs> during the week or possibly over the weekend. Uh, then prior to the meeting itself, this is the meeting with David uh, and Ronnie, um, my recollection is that Richard Harrell and Brian Martin uh, met with me um, about half an hour before the meeting and we talked through these lines. So I'd already read it, I had questions in my mind, and uh, Richard and Brian took me through this submission um, uh, and right. answered any of my questions. Um, right. Um, so um, did they tell you, looking at the third bullet point, preliminary work leading to that publication has already started. Did they tell you what that work comprised of at that point? No. My, my, my recollection, and I think this is in my in one of my two statements, that it was at this meeting that the, 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 the design principle of co compartmentation was explained to me by Richard Harrell. I, I mentioned the sort of Jenga diagram uh, earlier. And we, we spent quite a lot of time uh, discussing that, that, that the way that ADB was structured, I think all the way back with previous versions to the 1960s, I saw your picture of Ronan Point that you showed to um, Mr. Wharton, um, was, were written in such a way as to make sure that the spread of fire was within a reasonable time uh, was impossible, um, both by the walls of the flat itself uh, and by the front door, and if there was an internal vestibule, to, to the fire doors themselves as well. And as I mentioned to you, I was familiar with with all of these issues, both because as a constituency MP, I'd spent a lot of time in such flats, and indeed, as uh, a temporary London resident during the week, I lived in a block of flats on the 10th floor. Mr. So Williams, I'm, I'm very sorry to interrupt you, and I don't mean to, to stop you, but I, I, I just wanted a specific answer to a specific question. Looking at the third bullet point there, preliminary work leading to that publication has already started. Did they tell you what that work comprised? No, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if my answer wasn't clear, Chairman. What, what I'm trying to say to you in, in that half hour pre-meeting, it would have been called, I recall discussing point one uh, and point two. Um, I don't, th we, we dis also discussed sprinklers uh, as well, because that was, as I understood it from what Brian had told me, that was Ronnie King's main issue over a long period of time that sprinklers should be installed in buildings. So we <coughs> certainly discussed those three uh, out of the seven, um, and given the half hour, uh, I don't think there was time to discuss anything else. And the meeting itself with the APG that seamlessly followed, hmm. we went from the ground floor to the top floor, so almost seamlessly, um, again, was only half an hour. So no, we didn't go in detail through all of those seven points, hmm. but we did discuss the three that I have mentioned. Right. Um, now, if we go to HOM 3048451, this is an email chain where your attendance at the 17th June meeting is confirmed and the briefing and the lines to take from Brian Martin sent into your private office. Now, if we go to the top of the chain, and of course you were not um, uh, personally on this uh, email chain, but um, your office was, but if you go to the very top, it's an email from Mike Larkin, uh, sorry, to Mike Larkin, from Louise Upton. Subject, FW, 
APPG on fire safety, 17th June. And, and it says this, um, for interest, Brian batting the APPG away. Uh, now, were you aware at the time that your officials were simply batting away the APPG's concerns with the briefing that you received? No. Can you account for why, at least on the face of this document, your officials appear to have regarded the APPG as something to be battled, batted away rather than embraced and understood? This, um, Chairman, this is the first time I've seen this, and I'm pretty horrified. <coughs> is this is, is, is my genuine reaction? Right. Um, there's no excuse for that. But, but it is the first time I've seen it, because it's, yeah, I mean, I mean my, 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 my outer office isn't copied in either, so you, I, didn't, I neither officially saw it or actually saw it, and I'm, that is a very unfortunate wrong phrase. Can you account for how such an attitude evolved within the officials in your department? I, it, I, I don't think I can, Chairman. I, don't, I understand why you have to ask me that, but I, I can't answer for how other people felt about other people. I don't even know who Mike Larkin is. I've never heard of him. Now, you mentioned your meeting uh, with Brian Martin uh, and Richard Harrell, I think, before the meeting. Yes. Um, you cover it a little bit in your second statement. Um, let's look at it. Um, page 12, paragraph 24, please. CLG 3034291. Um, paragraph 24. Uh, you say, I distinctly recall getting this impression of frustration from my briefing meeting with Bob Ledsom and Brian Martin prior to my 17th June 2014 meeting with the APPG. Uh, you refer to Bob meeting Bob Ledsom and Brian Martin. Um, it, was it Bob Ledsom or was it Richard Harrell or both? as well as Brian Martin at that meeting. Sorry, just let me... It was definitely Richard who drew the diagram at, at that meeting, so maybe all three of them were there. I'm, <coughs> I'm, I'm sorry if that isn't clear here. I think I do mention right. somewhere else in the statement that it was at this meeting that Richard drew the diagram. Right. So I'm sorry it's not... You know, <coughs> Right. Now, what not, I don't think Bob was there, but I'm, I'm not sure. Now, what was it that gave you the impression of frustration with the APPG? Um, this is a difficult issue, obviously. Um, when, when I told the office that David had come up to me and said he wanted the meeting, and I'd, I'd agreed to have it, he said, well, they won't like that. And I said, well... I wouldn't say what I actually said, but it was tough something. We're, we're having it. Um, and then Kerr did say before we had the pre-meeting, because he would have accompanied me to the pre-meeting because it was a building regulations issue, and he tended to come to all of those meetings with officials, that they are furious with you uh, for doing this, but they won't say it to your face. I, I clearly, clearly re recall that. So, so... But Brian, Bob, neither Brian, Bob, nor Richard ever said anything to me personally that was derogatory either about David Amos or Ronnie King. I'm very clear about that. But my private secretary did tell me that they were annoyed with me, um, th that they are no minister had effectively been overturned. And uh, I'd agreed to the meeting. When you say they were annoyed with you, you mean your officials? Yes. Right. Right. Why, why did you tolerate that attitude by your officials? It's not for them to be annoyed with you if you decide to meet another minister in response to a request. I think officials are human beings. An, <coughs> right. they, have, they have their personal opinions as well as their professional viewpoints. And um, possibly I was the minister that irritated them the least in terms of what they were dealing with at the time. But it doesn't mean, you know, <laughs> they, were, they were quite a liberty to be irritated by decisions that other ministers in the department made as well, and I'm sure they were. Were you given the... But the point, the important point, Chairman, is that they did not say that to the minister themselves, because that, as I say, would be crossing the line. Were you given the impression by Brian Martin or Richard Harrell or perhaps Bob Ledsom that the APPG's concerns as a matter of substance were 
unfounded or invalid or did not require the department's time and consideration? I wouldn't use any of those words, but they, they certainly did give me... First of all, the procedural um, point that they are entitled to their views, um, but that's what they are. They, 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 they are views about a complicated issue to which there are many views that could be fed into to ministers and, and, and officials from, from other people. And I just wanted to make sure that those views whether or not they were valid or coherent or, or backed up by evidence, were, were at least in the mix of what the department was going to consider. Um, but I knew, of course, at this stage that the other viewpoints uh, were being fed in as well. In fact, you know, that, that's what I told, told the meeting. Um, now, was this the first time you'd met with members of the APPG? Uh, well, no, obviously I knew David Amos personally. Um, it was the first time I'd ever heard of or met Ronnie, Ronnie, Ronnie King, yes. And, so, and so, it was the first, sorry, the first time I saw him in person. Now, Brian Martin attended with you, as you say, in your first state. That, that's right. He was, he, was, he was sat to my right. Uh, it was a horseshoe House of Commons committee room that you'll be familiar with from TV. Uh, David and Ronnie King were directly opposite me, but uh, probably as close as you are, Chairman, uh, to me at the moment. Yeah. But we were the only people there. And what part did Mr. Martin play in the meeting? That, that, that genuinely is hard for me to be certain about, but given that David did hand over to Ronnie to ask questions, um, I would almost certainly have asked Brian to answer. What was discussed at the meeting? Timetable and sprinklers from, from memory. Now, if we go to RKI... But, they, but, but, but no, again, this is perhaps unsatisfactory, but the, the, the APG themselves didn't, um, didn't um, take a record of their meetings, unlike other APPGs, or, and certainly a, I mean, a select committee is, 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 has a stenographer and everything is on the record. It is part of Parliament's work, whereas an APBG is is an informal discussion. Ministers are not accountable to them, so no record of the meetings are kept by government, and it's up to the APUG whether they keep a record, and it seems in this instance no record was kept. So I'm afraid you are having to rely on my memory that it was the timetable and sprinklers that we discussed. Can we go to RKI 6012, please? Here are the APPG's minutes of the meeting of the 17th of June, 2014. And we can see that uh, uh, the list who, of those in attendance, David Amos, Roger Williams, Pete Aldous, Nick Rainsford, uh, Ronnie King, etc., and, and a long list uh, of those there, and a, an even longer list of those who, uh, whose apologies were noted. Can we go to page three, please? Halfway down the, the paragraph starting, the minister. You see that? Mm -hmm. The minister then explained. And halfway down that, um, it says, well, I'll, I'll show it to you. It says, the minister then explained that a, a review of building regulations, approved document B, has now commenced to be completed and published in 2016 to 17. This involves a lot of stakeholders and interested parties and needed to be structured, considered, and thorough. He was of the view that any changes felt necessary should form part of the review, which he wasn't minded to bring forward. Now, that is what you were told to say, so it appears, in the briefing note handed to you by Brian Martin. Yes? That's one of the lines to take. Yes. Yes. Did you deter from the agreed script at all during that meeting? That's hard to know because um, I said to you earlier that one of my personal frustrations as a minister, that you were not meant to extemporise. You, you are there as an official representative uh, with corporate responsibility for other ministers and the government uh, as, as a whole. You're not there to offer personal opinions or deviate from what is a government position. And, in this case, in, and on this occasion, a government position that had been set out by the Secretary of State of my own department. So my guess is, despite my normal inclination, I probably didn't extemporize away from it. Uh, the note goes on. The on admin sec re-emphasised to members and the minister that the all-party group wasn't asking to bring forward the review of building regs ADB, but for small amendments stroke updates to the approved document to be made, as was permitted, and it had occurred in 2010 and 2013, 
The last major review of the approved document was in 2005, making 11 to 12 years before any changes will take effect. There are potentially significant life safety benefits making those two small and simple amendments now. Do you, you recall Mr King making those comments? I, I don't, and um, uh, Chairman, this is the first time I've read this, so I now have to slightly withdraw what I said earlier. I didn't think a record of the meeting had been routinely kept. Um, it, this has not been shown to me, was not shown to me uh, at the time as, as a record of, of the meeting. When you say and, and the other people on the first page who are listed um, didn't say anything to the, to the best of my recollection. It was only Ronnie King who spoke. Right. Um, I take it that you didn't see, see this minute after no. the meeting. No, 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 no uh, ab absolutely not. I'm literally reading it for the first time. Understood. Um, in any event, after this meeting, did you understand that significant life safety matters were being held up by the revision process of approved document B taking until 2016 or 2017? I'm not sure being held up is entirely fair as a summary of what I might have thought at the time because work was underway. So it, at that point in time, neither I nor officials were holding anything up. What, what was under discussion was whether 2016, 17, whatever that means, which <laughs> unfortunately does sound as though several of us had different interpretations in our mind as to what it meant, but whatever it meant, that's, that's two years down the line from, from where we are at the moment. At this point in time, in the summer of 2014, I did not think that a review of Part B was being held up. Now, if we look at your second statement, please, page 10, paragraph 19, you say, I was not asked to and did not give any consideration to potential amendments to the building regulations with regard to any issues raised in relation to the fire at Lachnell House. Similarly, I was not given any advice on, and so did, did not give consideration to, potential changes to approved document B which might go wider than simplification of wording. That's what you say in your statement. Now, can we go back to the document, please, we were looking at, page three, just below halfway down. You could see that the odd... The honorary admin sec, that's Ronnie King, uh, said that the APPG wasn't asking to bring forward the review of Building Regs ADB, but for small amendments and updates to the approved document to be made, as was permitted, and had occurred in 2010 and 2013. So I mean, looking at that, do you accept that you were being asked by the APPG to make specific amendments to approved document B? Yes? My... My recollection is that possibly straight after this meeting, I can't remember where I went next, it was probably onto something utterly different, um, but possibly the next time I saw the relevant officials was that the view was that the APBG, which, which really is Ronnie King, um, was not only wanting to change the time scale, whether it's the backstop date of 2016, 2017, or piecemeal, as you say, uh, amendments earlier, but, but also wanted to be the arbiter on what those changes should be. And that clearly is not a position that any government would accept, that, that the review of such an important document, as you've said several times, a, a document that, that has at the heart of it the protection of, of life, should, should be based on properly sourced evidence, possibly from a variety of sources, and, and should not follow um, the, the, the opinions considered as they may be of, of, of one individual. And you know, I would have been definitely uh, irresponsible if I'd said as a result of this meeting, well, let's make all the changes that they would like to make at the time they, they would like to make. I mean, officials were then being quite within their rights to say no minister to me and it would have gone to the Secretary of State probably to you know, underline the timetable that had already been agreed. And I, I think, Chairman, there's another relevant issue. You mentioned, the, Mr. Millick mentioned the deregulatory 
environment mm -hmm. uh, in the first session, I think this morning, um, th there was the policy of the government that regulation should not be updated in a piecemeal fashion because that wasn't helpful to anybody. That regulation should be a considered whole body work and should be updated on a date that was known to everyone. I think they were called common commencement dates. This was a reform that the coalition did introduce. From memory, the common commencement dates were the 1st of April and the 1st of October. Anyway, six months apart in a year. I'm pretty sure those, those, those were the dates. And there should be no surprises for anybody uh, external to government. You go through a process, you revise everything at the same time and publish a new regulation, including a building regulation, on a common commencement date, you don't make piecemeal changes. And that, so that wasn't, you know, that, that's not my view or Brian Martin's view or Bob Ledson's view, that was government policy from the very top of government. Do you accept, looking at this note, that you were being asked to make specific amendments to approve document B? I accept that I was being asked to, but yes. the reasons I've just said, just because someone asks a minister to do something, uh, doesn't mean you then immediately think, I must do that, if other people are telling you. Um, there is a process, we are going to follow it, and what these people are telling you will be taken into account. And there are later occasions when, uh, when that point is made, you know, they, they are reassured. You, they, they may well have been, it, the irritation may have gone two ways. <laughs> that, that Ronnie King was irritated with officials, officials were irritated with Ronnie King, but at every point in that process, they were being assured, in what came from me, that their, their viewpoints were going to be taken into account. And on, uh, it was probably the very last occasion that I said anything on the record about this in March 2015, which was, um, uh, at a German debate in the House of Commons, I reiterated all this, that the timetable was on track and that sprinklers would be looked at. I, I know you're not allowed to necessarily look at what's in Hansard or whatever as part of the inquiry rules, but can you take it from me that I did say that on the record in March 2015, which was two weeks before I ceased to be a minister, effectively. So at that point, I was giving public assurances on the record that what what had been asked for had been listened to, including the substantial issue of sprinklers, and it would be taken into effect. And that was agreed with officials, including um, <coughs> not just Brian Martin, but Louise Upton, who was the actual fire safety expert in the department. Um, can we go back to your statement then, please? <coughs> when I just referred you to it. Second statement, page 10, paragraph 19, first sentence, where you say, I was not asked to and did not give any consideration to potential amendments to the building regulations with regard to any issues raised in relation to the fire at Knackle House. Did you not understand that that was exactly what Ronnie King was asking you? To make specific amendments to cater for what had happened at Lackenall? So I think, I think my answer in paragraph 19 here is a general statement that officially, <laughs> during my period as a minister, I wasn't asked by, by the civil service to consider particular changes that might be made to approve document B, simply because the timetable for that consideration was, however it panned out, going to be after my time as a minister. So delving into the detail of what is or what isn't in part B would have taken place if it had progressed on time, probably, in the autumn, winter of 2015, 2016, gone out to consultation with industry thereafter and somehow produced a revised document according to the timetable the Secretary of State set out. But detailed consideration of what's in or what isn't in Part B was, was never an issue that I was going to be the arbiter of. Did you ever consider making more timely amendments or looking to make more timely amendments to ADB to address the coroner's specific concerns and the APPG's specific concerns, rather than waiting another three years to revise the whole document? Uh, I've already said, uh, Chairman, that there were cross-government rules about the regularity of revision to regulation, and that revision to regulation should be a complete 
piece of work rather than a piecemeal piece of work. So that, that, you know, that, 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 was, you know, that was not my decision, but, but it's not a decision I disagree with. I'm not you know, deviating from it. I think that is a reasonable position for the government to have taken uh, at the time, and it's reasonable for society to uh, expect that government goes through an evidence-led process and only regulates and re-regulates, updates regulations on a predicted basis. That's probably an improvement to what had happened before. Is it the case that you were never intending to make any amendments to approve document B other than to simplify the wording, or is that wrong? It, it, it's, it's a question that I'm not in a position to answer because as I've tried uh, just now to explain, the substantial content of ADBB was not something during my tenure as minister that I would be deciding. I, my, my role at that time in the sequence of events was to make sure it was on track, that the research had been commissioned, which I think you're going to, probably going to come to, uh, and that at the time I left office in, well, effectively March 2015, but officially May 2015, that I'd done what I could to make sure that that review by 2016, 2017 would happen. And I'm pretty sure I did that. Can we go back to the notes, please, of the APPG meeting? Page three again. <clears throat> Thank you. And if we go to page three, uh, towards the bottom, it says this. The requested update of the BRE report, replacing the one shown on CLG's website from 2005 to 2012, and underpinning the regulations, together with the removal of the naught classification of window panels on outside walls of tall blocks of flats, replacing it with a requirement for fire resistance was easily achieved wasn't anything new and didn't need to wait until 2017 to effect. Now, j just pausing there, did you recall that the BRE report referred to there uh, was a BRE cost-benefit analysis commissioned by the sprinkler industry and SOFOA, the Chief Fire Officers Association? So did, did I know it was there? Yeah, did you Does know it, it was that? Did you know that it was a cost-benefit analysis done by BRE, commissioned by the sprinkler industry and the Chief Fire Officers Association? Um, I, I can't... It's difficult for me to say now whether I knew that right. at the time, but if I did know it, given that the BRE are a world-class building research institution, and I assume the sprinklers industry would want more sprinklers, it would not have been unreasonable for, for them to express an opinion on it. Did you know, or did you know anything about Class Nord? No. Was this the first you'd heard of Class Nord, or National Class Nord? Uh, I don't recall, I've got a pretty good memory for lots of, lots of things, but I, I generally don't recall any discussion about what Class Nord was. You didn't ask Brian Martin, what's Class North, or Class O, as some, sometimes people call it? Well, I've just said to you that I've, we're working through a note I've not seen before. So no, is the Well, I, I can't ask a question about a note I've not seen. No, but you can help me with your recollection. Do, do you recall asking Brian Martin a question, what is Class North, or what is Class O? That's the first I've heard of it. Did you no, but for in order for me to ask... Brian or anybody else, more likely Richard, what, what, what is class naught? Someone would have to have said to me something about class naught that wasn't in itself self-explanatory. And Did I you... don't recall any discussion about class naught at all. I don't know what it is now. So. Uh, did you ever become aware of criticism or concern over the national classification standards for reaction to fire on external walls, no. of which class naught was one. No? No. no. Continuing with, with the notes, Brian, it says this at the top of the page. Brian Martin said, firstly, that the odd and min sec was in a minority of one in asking for this. The panels under the windows at Lacknell House were only part of a composite structure, and it wasn't as simple as was being suggested. A combination of events had led to the fire spread at Lacknell House. Secondly, in relation to the update of the quoted BRE research on CLG's website, he said that because CLG hadn't commissioned the 2012 BRE report, they didn't need to act upon it. The admin, and se uh, admin sec was quite astounded and challenged both statements. 
And can you remember, what was the combination of events, as you understood it at the time, that had led to the Lackland House fire? Um, I think I said to you this, this morning that the discussion that I had about the uh, circumstances that led to the Lackland House fire were very short and at most on only two occasions. I think when the November 2013 submission was sent up to me about the competent person scheme for windows and in preparation for this meeting, yes. uh, when, when Richard Harrell explained compartments to me. So those are the only two occasions that a discussion about Lackanall House would, would have taken place, and they would have been very, very short discussions, not, you know, not, not an in-depth mm. analysis. Can I just ask you to look at CLG 3019243? Uh, this is a letter addressed to you dated the 12th of March 2014. Uh, uh, from the APPG, uh, Ronnie, under the hand of Ronnie King, as you can see if you go to the foot of page, or the middle of page three. Can I just direct you uh, to um, page two, please? Now, this, of course, is before, a few months before this meeting. Um, I suppose I ought to ask you first whether you've ever seen this letter before. Um. I, should get I, 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 I can't be sure, but... No. no, no look at, uh, to be fair to you, it's, it's a question better answered by reference to the first page, which, I, which is now on the screen. Does it look familiar to you, do you think? Uh, I, I'm not being evasive, Chairman. It, it's, it's very difficult for me to say that a letter is, <coughs> is familiar. Um, I have already told you that, uh, both as a minister and a member of parliament, I would have seen hundreds of letters uh, you know, if, if every week or fortnight, and I, it, it, I'm a human being. I can't, I can't remember seeing a letter that was not something that I had a strongly held personal view about. So there's no reason for it to stick in my memory, is what I'm trying to say. No, fair enough. Let, let me see if this, what I'm about to show you, triggers the recollection. Foot of page two, Mr. King says this. It seems astounding to me that although clarification was given by the department at the inquest that the composite panels under the external wall window sets of flats at Lackland House were only required to be class naught to comply with the building regulations and need not have had the fire resistance required under the former Section 20 London Building Acts, that this dangerous situation, allowing fire to spread externally into flat 79 within four and a half minutes, has still not been corrected in the approved document guidance. Now, do you, does that tr trigger a recollection? Do you recall reading that at this time in, in a letter the, the, like this? The, that particular point um, d does trigger a memory, but I can't be sure that it's in the context of this letter or the discussion I had um, before the APBG meeting or, in, or indeed in November 2013 about the circumstances of Lackenhall. As I said, it, the way it was explained to me was that the windows had not been installed Although it was a complicated issue, it had not been installed in compliance with regulations. The plastic had melted, melted down the building, and had melted probably, I assume, the windows in the flat underneath, and had caused combustion. But it was an extraordinary event. And so, so that really is the beginning and the end, Chairman, of my knowledge of what happened at, at Lackanall. You, you, you might say to me, Mr. Millet, well, why didn't you want to know more? Well, I'm, I, did, did I really need to know more? I, I understood something had gone wrong, catastrophically and sadly wrong, uh, for, for, the, for the people concerned, but steps were being taken to address it with the Windows uh, uh, submission that I'd seen in November 2013, and there had been a commitment to revise Part B. So, 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 so yes, it does trigger a memory, but I, I can't be sure whether it's because of this letter or because of the verbal discussion uh, I had with Richard Howell and Brian Martin um, a month later, I think. A month later being, what, mid-July? Uh, uh, so, so, sorry, I, I've only got page three on, on my screen. I can't see the date the of this date letter. The date of the letter I showed you was March. Um, it would go back to page one. We could see 12th of March, 2014. Right. Well, by that stage, we, we had had the discussion in November 2013 um, about the Windows scheme, where competent persons in general were 
we were explaining this is a, something I'd you know, never heard of uh, before how, how competent person schemes worked. And, and Lacanol was mentioned to me, but as I say very briefly, but there wasn't, you know, there wasn't any reason for me to have any more knowledge than was already being given to me. Um, I'm not trying to hide behind officials being the experts and ministers being the generalists, but in something like this, that is generally the position. <clears throat> well, whether you had the technical knowledge or not, of course, which is a, a Well, there's a, a lot of question. technical jargon in this letter, isn't it? Um, technical language, sorry, in, 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 in this letter that I could, have, yeah. could unpick every single one of it and ask officials to explain this, 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 and this to me, but given that they understood it, was it really necessary for me to understand everything that my officials understood? Well, you've Sorry, asked that's a, a rhetorical question. You've asked a rhetorical question. And what is the, what is the actual answer? I, I think the actual answer from me to my own rhetorical question is I don't think that's a reasonable expectation of, of a minister. It's not, it's not what the role of a minister is in our parliamentary democracy, is to know <coughs> everything that their officials know. Why, why would you need officials otherwise? So, you, so your knowledge cannot mirror the knowledge of an official. You, you can understand sufficient of what they understand to make important decisions at critical milestones, but you can't understand everything behind that. Otherwise, you'd never get anything done. You know, Attlee At At said that the worst ministers are experts. Yes, because because they, they're constantly second-guessing their officials. Yeah, but wouldn't you want to be satisfied when you were corresponding with your fellow parliamentarians, such as David Amis? Um, that their concerns had been fully, thoroughly, robustly and rigorously addressed by your officials through you so that you could at least understand that they were being fully addressed. You don't need to understand the technical, no, uh, that's, underlying that's technical material, but at least be able to understand in your own mind that the matter was, was being properly looked at. Yes, I, 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 absolutely, Chairman. I, that, that certainly is what a reasonable expectation of what a minister should do that should reasonably expect that if something is drawn to the attention of policy officials in their department, that they're not just taking note of that, they are considering it. Um, but, as I did say earlier, there are lots of experts offering them views. Now, I, I don't know whether, going back to the note of, of the meeting, whether Ronnie King was really in a minority of one in his opinion about something. That was Brian Martin's opinion of Ronnie King's opinions. But you know, I, I wasn't to know whether he really was in a minority of one, but that is what I was told. But how would you stop yourself simply being a mouthpiece for your officials uh, on whatever it is they felt uh, you needed or didn't need to say? Because on lots of issues, I never was a mouthpiece. Who knows me? So I'm not. I'm not a mouthpiece for, for other people. But when you're given advice, your profession is 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 giving advice to people. People who take that advice are not your mouthpiece, are they? They are taking your advice because you're the professional person to offer them advice, and that's why you're being paid. And the same is true of of of, of a civil servant. A civil servant is there to give advice to a minister, and a minister must, there must be a reasonable expectation that you take that advice at face value. If lots of other people come into you and, and give contrary viewpoints to what your official is, is saying, then of course you think, well, how about, is this person really giving me the whole picture? But that wasn't the case here. There weren't lots of other people beating down the door to my office and saying, do you know what, Ronnie King is, is, is right on this, your officials are not up to it, don't listen to your officials, listen to him. Nobody said that to me, not a single person. And there were plenty of, there were plenty of people could have done, but they didn't. Now, so I, so I, yes, so it's, yes, I did trust my officials. Hmm. Let's move on in the time. July 2014, CLG 3019260. <clears throat> I don't think we need to look at this in any detail, but this is a, a document which gives us a time mark. Um, when you signed off on the Building Regulation and Standards External Research and Implementation Programme. Do you remember doing that? Yes, I do. Right. Uh, and that programme, is this right, included carrying out an independent review and evaluation of approved document B? Amongst lots of other things, yes. And by the time you left the department in May 2015, uh, had that review begun? Yes. It had begun? Yes. What, what, what I 
did not know. Um, and I've had to ask the question of the department in order to, uh, well, to prepare for today, I suppose. Um, when did that research come back? And I've been told it came back uh, at the end of February 2015. And obviously, coming back to the department means it came back to the officials, not, not to me or my, my private office. At the end of February 2015, I had three weeks left. So, you know, quite obviously, I wasn't shown it or, or even advised that it, that it had come back. And by the time you left the department in May 2015, did you think that the timetable to publish a new version of approved document B was on track or, or not? Yes, I did, um, because, because we had commissioned this, this, this research. I said the research from, from memory, because I have reread the submission in preparation for, for today, was, was for, I think, about one and a half million pounds worth of research across lots of areas of the building regulations, you know, all of which were important in their own rights. As I said earlier, Part B is not the only important part of the building regulations. Most, or indeed all of them, are to, are to do with personal safety. So there was a research on a variety of issues um, being undertaken. And evidence-based policy, I think, is the best policy. Now, um, let's go to CLG 301290. This is a letter from David Amos uh, to you on the 5th of August. 2014, there it is, and it's got a handwritten scribble, uh, SW, <coughs> building regs, S, it looks like SB, um, 5th of August 2014. Now, just looking at it, first paragraph to refresh your, um, what may or may not be your recollection. Thank you for your attending the 17th June meeting of the all party group where you outlined the review of the building regulations approved document B, currently underway, which involves a lot of stakeholders and interested parties and is to be completed in 2016 to 17. And just looking at that, do you recall reading this letter at the time? I can't, I can't be sure, but of course you'll have to show me the reply to, I mean, I mean obviously I, it is easier for me to, to, to remember my replies rather, rather than to what I was replying to. Uh, yes, I will, I will show you the reply. Um, uh, in fact, let's, since you've asked, I'll, 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 let's do that and then we'll come back to the letter because I've got some more substance in it to ask you about. But CLG 3019439, we can go to that. There's your reply. Mm. I do recognise this letter. You recognise <laughs> this letter? Yeah. Do you recognise the letter that you were responding to? Um, well, as I say, that, that is harder for anybody to do, isn't it? Because you remember what you say rather than what somebody else says more, more readily. Um, but also, this, this, uh, a sentence from this letter has been much quoted, so it's, it's not, if it was being shown to me for the first time, it's possible I wouldn't remember it, but because it has been quoted, uh, I'm obviously familiar with this letter and, and the tone of it, which no doubt you're, you're probably going to ask me about. Well, let's go to the letter of the 5th of August from David Amos, if we may. Um, let's pick it up in the second paragraph. It's the, pre the previous document, uh, CLG 3011290. And in the second paragraph, it says, you were of the view that any changes felt necessary should form part of that review, which you weren't minded to bring forward. The members decided to consider your response at a reconvened meeting, given the limited time available on 17th <coughs> June, and met again on the 22nd July, where the matters raised were further discussed. After giving full consideration to the matters before them, and taking account of the 12 years which will have elapsed since the last review of the regulations approved document B, there are issues which the group feels requires imme require immediate attention by simple amendments, as has been undertaken in 2007, 2010, and 2013. A sample of previous amendments to illustrate this process is enclosed at Appendix A. Uh, and um, he then gives some examples, <coughs> or samples, um, the first is sprinklers in residential and commercial premises. And then if we go to page two, the second amendment being sought is in relation to fire resistance for component parts of the external walls of blocks of flats over 18 metres in height. Uh, and there's then a reference towards the bottom of that page to simulated tests. Uh, did you ever seek to understand exactly why it was that it was said that fire performance standards for external walls were unsatisfactory? Um, no, but as we've covered now quite a few times, the review was underway, and, and definitely was underway at this, this, this point, not just in the research that 
you've told me the BRE had been asked to do before the coroner's letter, but, but also to the research that was commissioned uh, while I was the minister was, was underway. So I, so I knew that, and I, I'm sorry, Chairman, to keep laboring this point, that how Part B was going to be revised wasn't a matter for me. Right. And, and I see. It, 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 I'm not sure how many different ways I can explain that in terms of the responsibilities that I held at the time. We're now, what, six, five months, six months away from the end, as it were, of, 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 of that government when I had things that I could deliver in that period and was expected to deliver, including the zero carbon homes legislation, which, which, which is not a minor point, Chairman. I mean, if, 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 I guess there are members of the public watching, but but energy bills, are, apart from the war in Ukraine at the moment, probably the biggest issue in people's minds. So, so it wasn't a trivial point that I was concerned with at the time with my officials and was absolutely determined to land and deliver and get in place uh, as a minister, particularly as the other side of the coalition were equally determined to frustrate me from doing that. that, that that's what my focus was on with my officials to doing what I could do within my remit, within my, at that point, limited lifespan as a, as a minister, rather than deep diving into the issues that I couldn't influence and couldn't determine, and certainly not prejudge, uh, that were going to happen much later on in 2015 or even in, well into 2016. Did you read this letter, do you remember? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to have to give you an answer I've given before. It is very hard for me to be sure. I mean, obviously, I'm familiar with some of the issues because they'd come up uh, in conversations before, but I can't, I, I can't give you a definitive yes or no, which I know you'd like, that I read this letter line by line. But given that there are lots of uh, prece historical precedents and technical terms in here, I, you know, if, if I had read the letter in full, I would probably have thought, again, I'm having to reimagine what I would have thought at the time, that yes, these are clearly important issues, but I'm not currently, currently in a position to flick the dial on any of them. I'm, I'm just in a position to make sure that they are being considered and they'll be dealt with on a timely basis. And wh whatever other criticisms may or may not be made of me, when I did leave office in, in March 2015, it was, the review was on track. It's, it's a valid opinion as to consider whether that timetable should have ended <coughs> earlier in 2016, say, but, he, but, he, but even if people come to that viewpoint, it would still have been for subsequent ministers, and as we now know, there were several subsequent ministers, to, 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 to get into the detail of what the new Part B should say. Right, when you say, when you left office, the review was on track. Yes. Can you tell us precisely where you'd got to? The research had been uh, commissioned. Uh, the timetable, I'd been given no reason whatsoever to assume that it was off track. And, and we're back in the difficulty, Chairman. I know you're not supposed to look at stuff that's in Hansard. Finds an odd point, but but I know you're not. Um, but in March 2015, at a debate in Westminster Hall, which is an adjournment debate, is referred to in my statement. So I guess I can refer to it that way for the inquiry by Jonathan Evans. I confirmed on the record that the review was on track, and certain issues such as sprinklers were definitely going to be considered. So that that's my final word on the subject, as it were, as 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 a minister. Um, what I later became aghast about, as I'm sure lots of other people are, that, that after that point, the review seemed to have spun out of control and, and, and wasn't delivered, not only not delivered by whatever 2016, 2017 means, but you know, not even delivered much later. Well, I, I'm as angry about that as a lot of other people. Well, do you accept that there was not even a discussion document approved by you as a minister by the time you left, left, left office? Yes, I do accept that, but but there couldn't have been, could there? Because because the 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 evidence base was was commissioned, the actual evidence that was commissioned in response to the coroner, rather than the BRE work that I now know because you've told me was had started before, 
Um, maybe the department anticipated that Part B would need to be revised, so I don't, I don't see anything sinister in that. But those two pieces of work were being done. I did not know that the research had come back just before I, I left the department. No, nobody told me, oh, by the way, Minister, we've got this back, and you'll be relieved to know that we can get on with it now. Um, I didn't know that, but of course, what I was able to say um, at that debate in March 2015 was that the review was on track, and I, that wasn't my opinion. I'd been told by um, Louise and Brian that you can say that on the record. I wanted to say on the record to Jonathan Evans um, that we were dealing with it, and specifically sprinklers were going to be considered as part of the review. Yeah, now, you, the debate was the Sophie Rosser debate, wasn't it? That's right, yeah. Yes. You, you, you tell us in that last answer that you'd been told by Louise and Brian that you can say that on the record. And yes, just, 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 no. just like, so sorry. Now, did you ask them, before you went ahead and said it on the record, what precisely it was that had been done so that you could say it? Well, I knew the research had been commissioned. I didn't, I, I've already said to you, I, I didn't know it had come back. But in fact, at that point, I, I know now, because I, I asked the department, the research had come back probably two weeks before that debate took place. So therefore, officials were uh, speaking reasonably to me to say that you can say that. I mean, that, that, that debate confirms again you know, the 2016, 2017 uh, deadline. So, so you were simply telling the debate what you had been told in turn by your officials? Well, yes. But without scrutinising it to find out exactly what the content was? It's... I, I, I'm sorry, I guess this is frustrating for you as well, Chairman, that I have to keep explaining how the parliamentary process works. This is a half hour adjournment debate. It's not, you know, it's not an all day debate or three hours debate. It's a half hour adjournment debate where one backbench member of parliament uh, has 15 to 20 minutes to put across their points to a minister. Uh, the minister has 10 minutes to respond to what they say. Um, this is an occasion where you can slightly extemporize away from your prepared speech because obviously you're responding. Uh, so I think the comment about sprinklers, for instance, is me responding to Jonathan's comments. But, but the timetable information that we were on track uh, to deliver a revised document <coughs> was given to me by Brian Martin, who was the building regulations lead on fire safety, and Louise Upton, who was the, the general lead on fire resilience within the department, who normally worked to the fire minister. Um, this wasn't my debate. This is another thing about parliamentary procedure, Chairman. Sometimes you sign letters on behalf of other ministers uh, and you reply to debates and oral and written questions on behalf of other ministers. This debate was supposed to have been responded to by Penny Mordaunt, who was the fire minister uh, at the time, who also met, incidentally, with the APBG um, at the same time as me and gave them exactly the same government line as I did. Um, it was her debate to respond to, for whatever reason, which I now can't recall, she was called away to an event in her constituency and I stood in. So it was not quite done on the hoof, but it, it wasn't something I was expecting to do. Mr Chairman, is that a convenient moment? Yes, I think it is. Thank you very much. I think it's time we had another break, Mr Williams. We'll stop there. We'll resume, please, at 25 to 4. And again, please don't talk to anyone about your evidence or anything to do with it while you're out of the room. All right? Thanks so much. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Millett. 25 to 4, please. Thank you.
Would you ask Mr. Williams to come back in, please? Thank you. Right, Mr. Williams, ready to carry on? Yes. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, um, you respond to David Amos's letter in the letter we looked at a moment ago, CLG 3019439, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, and you say this. Uh, Dear David, thank you for your letter dated 5th August following our discussions of the all-party fire and rescue group on the future of fire, the fire safety aspects of building regulations. In your letter, you argue that three issues should be given immediate attention in advance of the current exercise, which is expected to be, com to be completed during 2016 to 17. I have neither seen nor heard anything that would suggest that consideration of these specific potential changes is urgent, and I'm not willing to disrupt the work of this department by asking that these matters be brought forward. However, I do acknowledge that the matters to which you refer are worthy of full consideration, and I've asked my officials to ensure that they are included in the ongoing re review. Regards, Stephen. Uh, now, um, who drafted that letter? Uh, well, again, Chairman, I, I, I can't be absolutely sure, but I, I assume it was Brian Martin authorised by Bob Ledson. Right. Now, I, I, I haven't shown you the three and a half page letter in full to which this is a response, uh, which con contains three major matters of suggested amendments to approve document B. Uh, including a long history of class naught and what is wrong with it. But given the careful and detailed letter to which this was a response, this is something of a brush off. Would you agree? I would. And um, I've already covered the fact that the, these letters aren't necessarily personal correspondence of the individual who happens to be a minister. They are government correspondence to which I sign, but I, I alone am responsible for for it going out of the building. Um, you, you can see by my personalization of it, um, something of a hint that I probably felt it was a brush off, which is why I've put, I don't know whether you can read my handwriting, uh, happy to have a chat in the lobby as always. So David and I liked each other. Um, so I, I, I didn't want to brush off, is a polite, <laughs> the polite way you put it. I didn't want to give him a, a uh, a brush off, but I, this is a hindsight view, Chairman. I, I do now regret sincerely that this letter left the building. I desperately wish I'd put a line through it and sent it back and saying, try again. I well, can you help us understand why it is, or how come it, it is the case that you're signing off formal letters by way of a brush off, but hinting to the recipient that you'd be amenable to a, a, a backstairs chat. D David would have known, and I would have known, that I didn't realize that the extent of the bad blood, but we both knew that the department's officials and Mr. King were, shall we put it, not the best of friends. And, and <laughs> You know, there, there was no mutual admiration or, or respect there. We both knew that. Um, David would have known it, I, I knew it, um, but it wasn't how David and I felt about each other, which is why I've put the handwritten note underneath and why indeed, you know, I, I mentioned before, we talked while, while, while voting. Um, but, but I just repeat again, I, I wish, I don't know whether you're going to ask me this later on, but this is one of the things where, because this letter has been quoted and has distressed people, you know, with hindsight, I wish it hadn't gone. Uh, and I wish um, I'd taken the time to, frankly, just send it back and say it's unacceptable um, and let, let's give a proper and considered view, because it's not as if there weren't things we could have said. You know, we, we've just discussed, was the review on track? Had the research been commissioned? Had a team been identified probably within the department to, to work on it? Um, 
other things. I, I, I mentioned earlier the review of Part P, which is also relevant to fire safety, had been done. I've been personally involved in that very heavily. We, we could have tabulated all of that and given a more thoughtful and considered response. Um, and I wish we had. Um, I, and I you know, don't, don't know, 19th of September, Parliament isn't sitting, probably. Um, uh, probably not sitting. That's party conference season normally. So I don't know the context in which I signed that letter, where I was, or whether there was an opportunity for me to send it back, or whether the, the, the other rule is an irritating one, Chairman, is, is, is that the department monitored the speed to which letters were responded to. It may well have what is it, 5th of August, 19th of September. Yeah, that probably breaches the, the response time. Um, but obviously, parliamentary recess covers quite a lot of that. Um, I don't know what the reasons were why I didn't send it back. I generally don't know. Um, again, it may have been I was signing lots of letters, saw this one, thought, oh, it shouldn't be that way, which is why I've added the note. But I wish now I'd you know, taken my red pen and put a line through it said to Kerr or whoever the private secretary was who was handing it to me at the time, this is not good enough. I, I wish I'd done that, and I'm sorry I didn't. Is it fair to say that you were being led uncritically by your officials? No, it isn't, um, <laughs> because I had a lot of officials who, who reported to me a, 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 across a huge variety of issues, and I think I was a intellectually curious and critical minister. Uh, I, I was not someone who sat in the seat, enjoyed being a minister, and didn't care what I was doing. I mean, the scope of your inquiry is not to look at other stuff I did. I, I, I know that, Chairman, but you know, I, I wasn't uh, a minister who had no regard for what I was doing at all, um, in, including Part P, as I just mentioned, where the most common cause of fires was, <coughs> was electrical faults. And you know, I did resolve that issue. I, I could have chosen just to, you know, let it, let it go, but I said to officials, we're going to resolve this because it's important. And it was something I could do in my time mm. as, as a minister. Part, part B wasn't, wasn't uh, a document that I was going to be the, um, well, not the author, but the, the official author of. Uh, a minister or two down the tracks was going to be that, but I was involved in the preparatory stages preparatory stages had taken place, we should have said this much more fully in this letter that, dear David, please, please understand, I know you have con uh, concerns, I know you don't like the timetable, although they, they, they never said exactly what, what alternative timetable the department should have worked to. Uh, that, you know, there's nothing on, on that, either to do with the end date or, or when the piecemeal uh, uh, issues you discussed earlier should have been introduced. No, Mr. So work was underway, and I wish I wish this letter had never left the building, but it did, and that is my fault. Now, I want to show you a briefing that you received from Bob Ledson a little bit earlier in the same year, April 2014, CLG 3019744. And uh, it's addressed to you and Nick Bowles from Bob Ledsom, 30th of April 2014, titled Meeting with Oliver Letwin, Nick Bowles, Stephen Williams and Alex Morton on the approved document 7th May 2014. Now, Alex Morton was a special advisor, I think, wasn't he? A conservative special advisor, yeah. Uh, right. And now under the heading background, it says this. The approved documents, if we scroll down, thank you. The approved documents are a fundamental element of the building control system, setting out reasonable minimum standards to ensure health and safety in completed building work and to avoid failures such as structural collapse seen recently in Bangladesh and Latvia and other issues such as New Zealand's leaky home crisis. Um, and if we go to considerations... Uh, it's right at the foot of the page and over to page two. It says, under paragraph six, we entirely agree uh, that there is scope to significantly improve the approved documents and propose to scope out a programme of work aimed at ensuring guidance is as lean as possible whilst meeting industry needs. For some approved documents where technical content is up to date, 
We would concentrate on simplification and improving clarity of language to make life easier for developers. For some ADs, we will need to undertake a fundamental review because technical guidance is now getting out of date, particularly Part B, fire, and Part M, access to and use of buildings. Yeah. What technical aspects of approved document B were considered to be getting out of date at this time? Um, I, I, I don't know. Um, what, what the technical aspects would, would, have, would have been that, that were out of date. Cle clearly, the way buildings are constructed does change over time, and you, you'd want a regulatory environment to be, well, at least complementary to, uh, or indeed ahead of, 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 of how buildings are constructed, but, but not to fall too far behind. Were there any but, but I don't, but I, to answer your question directly, no, no I don't no. know what the, what the issues were. Did you ask? Um, Possibly not, other, other, other than the discussion that, that you know from earlier answers that we had had about windows and we had had about sprinklers. I, I didn't ask for a definitive list, but Chairman, this does come back to the point that this was not something I was involved with con contemporaneous uh, uh, with, with this submission, whereas part M, which I, I think is um, disabled access, Thank you. Um, um, I, I had a nod from the member of the, the panel, which I was uh, agreeing to. I was in, involved with um, and had lots of meetings with industry and um, chaired a meeting at the Design Council about updating the, the, the professional requirements of everyone in the built environment to make sure uh, that they took into account the needs of uh, disabled people. So that is something I was involved with at the time, even in a substantial sense, um, was part B, yes, I was involved with, but not at the detailed consideration stage. Well, well, so I think it's reasonable for me to have more of an understanding of what, what was needed in part M than what was needed in part B, because we were doing it. Well, and, and meetings, sorry, come on. No, do finish your answer. I, I, I was just going to say, I shouldn't anticipate your questions, but I'm guessing you might ask me what generally do I remember about this meeting. I had quite a lot of meetings with Oliver Letwin. No, I wasn't going to ask you. Oh, right, okay. Well, I'd I, like did, to, I did have lots of meetings with Oliver Letwin. I'd like so. to ask you a focused question on the last sentence there, which says, for some ADs, we will need to undertake a fundamental review because technical guidance is now getting out of date, particularly Part B, fire. Question, did you ask whether there was any public safety implication arising from the fact that Part B fire was getting out of date? Um, well, I think I knew it was perceived as being out of date because that's why the department had committed to a review. No, no. Did, you, did you ask the question, are there any public safety implications from the fact that Part B is, out, is getting out of date? Did you ask any official that question? I don't think so. But again, you're, you're asking me to remember what I asked at a particular meeting. And I, 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 so I'm, I'm telling you, right. <laughs> uh, I don't think I did. But this, but this was a meeting which you know, had lots of fingers in the pie. Um, as I said, there were numerous meetings with Oliver Letwin because he was the Minister for Government Policy. So you had his own views on everything the department was doing and lots of other departments, so I was regularly summoned to number nine Downing Street to, to go through issues with him, in particular on zero carbon homes uh, and space standards, you know, where he made it quite clear, if you weren't here, we wouldn't be doing, you know, we, we as in Conservatives would not be doing this. As a self-styled curious minister, did you not want to know, get to the bottom of, whether there was a public safety risk in allowing Part B to become out of date. Well, I did, didn't think I was personally, because you, you made the question personal, I did not think I was personally presiding over a situation where the document was, if you like, deteriorating out of date. I thought I was the minister that was in post while the evidence was gathered to make sure that the document was brought up to date, but the actual bringing up to date of that document, I knew, was not a matter for me. So I think it is reasonable for me to be less curious 
as he put it, and I put it, uh, about the detail because the substance was not going to be determined by me. Can we go then to the note of the meeting, CLG 3035301. Uh, this is an email <laughs> sent on the 8th of May 2014 <clears throat> uh, with the note of the 7th of May meeting attached to it. Uh, and it went from uh, Richard Nick Bowles' office, it looks like, at the very top, to Richard Harrell, copied to a cast, including Brian Martin. Uh, and uh, it says, thanks for preparing this briefing note for the meeting with Oliver Letwin and Alex Morton, a brief note and actions below. And if you look down the email at page two, please, you can see fifth bullet point down. Uh, it, it says there, NB noted. Do you see NB noted? Yes. NB noted he's still keen for a program of work to streamline, stroke, put the existing approved documents into plain English. This should be scoped to take place once the housing standards review has been completed at the end of the year. Yep. Now, do you remember that being discussed at the meeting? Uh, no, but, but you know, as I said, I had lots of meetings with Oliver. Nick, Nick Bowles was the Minister for Planning. Uh, with which I had a joint responsibility for neighbourhood planning. Uh, you know, he wasn't the minister who presided over building regulation, building regulations. So it, I like Nick, so I don't want to be rude about him, and he's not here anyway. Um, that might be a slightly naive comment that by the end of the year, by the end of 2014, the whole of the building regulations to be put into plain English was perhaps ambitious. Well, it's the approved documents, in fact. But, I mean, did, did you ever challenge the timetable, the idea that there wouldn't even be a plain English review uh, uh, scoped until after the housing standards review had been completed? Well, just because Nick said he was keen for something to happen didn't mean that it had been agreed by the department, including the Secretary of State and all the processes that would be gone through. I mean, that, that, that's a major exercise, isn't it? Um, <coughs> ask me if I remember. I, ge I generally don't remember that particular uh, comment being made. You know, major has been a, a comment he made and no one responded to it. Um, I, so I don't remember it, but it, it, it's, it's not an easy ask that he was making. Oliver Letwin wanted um, the Housing Standards Review to, to say that houses should look nice, you know, like, like all the houses in West Dorset, um, probably heavily influenced by a significant person um, in that respect. But that doesn't mean it can realistically happen. And I think putting all of the, all of the documents in, into plain English by the end of 2014 was um, not something I ever had advice over. I, I generally don't remember this. I, w I would have remembered it if, if subsequent to this meeting, officials had come to me and said, well, Nick Bowles asked for this. This is why it can't be done. This is why it can be done. Or this is when it could be done by. Uh, I, I don't think that happened. So it's, it's a minuted remark that the minister made, and that's, that, that, that's fair enough. But I don't think it was realistically anything that was expected to be taken forward. Uh, now, Sir David Amos writes to you again in October 2014, <clears throat> moving further back into the year. Can we go to CLG 3030867? And he responds to your 19th of September letter that we've just looked at as follows. Dear Stephen, thank you for your letter of the 19th of September last in reply to my letter of the 5th of August, which was considered by the group at its meeting on the 21st October. The group notes that you have neither seen nor heard anything that the matters raised suggest that they were urgent and that you were not therefore willing to ask for them to be brought forward. They were at a loss to understand how you had concluded that credible and independent evidence which had life safety implications was not in the capital letters, not considered to be urgent, when amendments of much lesser importance to the approved document had been made between reviews. As a consequence, the group wishes to point out to you that should a major fire tragedy with loss of life occur between now and 2017, in, for example, a residential care facility or a purpose-built block of flats, where the matters which had been raised here were found to be contributory to the outcome, then the group would be bound to bring this to others' attention. We turn the page. I'm sorry that we could not come to a satisfactory agreement on a way forward during our discussions. 
and exchanges of correspondence. Best regards, David Amos, MP, Chairman. Now, in your statement, you say you don't recall seeing this letter. Th that, that, that that's right? correct, and because um, this this letter was put into the public domain, as it were, um, I did not recall ever seeing it, and asked the department, did I see it, and was there a reply, and it could not be traced. I mean, I noticed there's, there's no signature. I think this is a draft, uh, I'm speculating, Chairman, this is a letter that was drafted by Ronnie King but not sent by David Amos. I, I don't know, but, but um, I do not recall seeing it. It's quite a starkly worded letter, so I think it's something I would recall. Uh, I would recall seeing if I had seen it, um, but I'm pretty sure I didn't. And when I checked with the department, um, what did we do about this letter, <coughs> that there was no record of it being received. There was no record of a response Obviously, there couldn't be because uh, the department didn't have a copy of it. There is no chasing of a response, so I assume it didn't reach us either because David didn't send it, uh, or because well, it, it didn't reach the department for whatever reason. What do you say about its contents? Now you're, you're asking me to comment on something that I didn't see and possibly was never sent. Well, let me, put, let me put this to you. Do you accept now, looking at it, that the concerns of this group brought repeatedly to your attention as minister were not exaggerated doomsaying, but a genuine vision of mass death based on a deep technical knowledge and wide professional experience held by the members of the APPG? No. Why not? Because I don't think the members of the APPG did have the deep, the way you just put it, did have the deep technical knowledge and experience. Um, Ronnie, I don't know anything about Ronnie King. I just knew he was a campaigner for, for the fire safety over a long period of time. I think he'd been a chief fire officer. So obviously he had professional experience. Uh, he was, I'm pretty sure, in the same way as officials drafted my letters, I'm pretty sure he would have written all the letters that came to the department, either to me or indeed quite a lot of other ministers, uh, from David Amos. Um, but I don't think it's fair for you to say, as you just did, that the group itself had, had detailed technical knowledge and a detailed te technical knowledge by implication that trumped the uh, and was counter to the, the professional knowledge that the department's officials who were there to advise me might, might have had. Very well. How would you then describe that last paragraph? Uh, uh, the one that begins, I am sorry that we could not no, I'm sorry, you're quite right. Uh, the last paragraph. That's the one that's on one. screen? Sorry. As a consequence, the group wishes to point out. Well, <laughs> was that just hysterical overstatement? Or was there something in what they were telling you? It's, it, I suppose fairness doesn't come into this, but it is, it is quite difficult for me to comment on a draft opinion that was n not received by the department or shown to me? And, and the department has no record of receiving. I've, I've been told this. Well, wait a minute. Uh, I'm just going to point out to you that it bears a CLG number, which means it was disclosed to us by the department. Y y well, well that, that's where we got it. Don't, yes, th that, that's because it's been, I, I think, Chairman, and I'm slightly at a disadvantage here because obviously I don't know the chain of events that's happened. It, it was a letter that was, I think, sent to the press uh, after the Grenfell fire, uh, saying you were, you were warned, but then the department, when I asked about this in 2018, which is the first instance I was asked to go into the department, back into the department, to go through all the submissions and meetings and anything that was in any way relevant to, to your inquiry, Chairman. Uh, you know, leave your uh, folder full of stuff. We spent a day in it, rather like we are now. I mentioned this letter. Um, because, you know, quite obviously it is her, uh, horrific uh, implication. And the department didn't have it. Uh, so, 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 so this, which, unlike the other letters that we've looked at, Chairman, uh, isn't, doesn't look topped or tailed personally and looks like a draft from a computer, which was obviously written by Ronnie King, um, uh, may, maybe David decided not to send it, but, but we, we can't possibly know that. 
Well, let's go to another letter then. CLG 1000 uh, and, and this doesn't go to you, so you should point that out straight away. And obviously has been received because it's got the date stamp and everything on it. Uh, and it's 1st of December 2015, sent to James Wharton MP, who I think was your, <coughs> your successor. On building regulations and local economies, yeah, but not on all the other stuff? Uh, on building regulations, yes. Uh, and uh, if we look at the second paragraph... Um, what is said by Sir David here is this. Over the past two years of correspondence between your predecessor, Stephen Williams, and myself, the group has felt continuous frustration over dismissive responses to its well-founded and justifiable concerns, whereas yesterday we did find a more considerate tone to the discussions, which was welcomed by all. Now, now le leaving aside the part of the sentence after the whereas, were you aware during your time as minister that um, the APPG considered that it had felt fr continuous frustration over dismissive responses to its well-founded and justifiable concerns. David never said that to me off the record. He, um, as a parliamentarian, he would have had many opportunities to say it on the record. Um, <coughs> he could have asked me an oral question, could have put down a written question, he could have gone to the press, could have done all sorts of things to say he thought um, it, uh, that he his concerns had been dismissed, but to the best of my knowledge, none of those things happened. So, you know, this, this is an opinion from one Eurosceptic Conservative MP to another Eurosceptic Conservative MP saying they thought he was nicer to them than I was, but I, you know, I, I don't think I was ever not nice to them. Some of the letters, I've, I've already you know, expressed my regret, Chairman, that um, I wish, with hindsight, um, I, I'd, I'd rejected or amended them, but the, there was certainly no either malicious or um, unfriendly dismissal of their viewpoint at all. I mean, like, given that I'd given them the meeting, the meeting they desperately wanted, they, they had against, against the advice I was given. So you know, I hadn't been dismissive. I think that, that is actually, an un, I'm thinking about it, also obviously I've never seen this before, that is an unfair statement. Um, I was not dismissive of them. They, they got an opportunity to put in person to the official who I now know there was uh, ill feeling towards reciprocally. Uh, at the time, they got an opportunity to speak directly uh, to him and, and assurances that their viewpoints would um, be part of the consideration for the review of Part B. At this point in December 2015, I think I should point out, Chairman, we now know the research had been in the department's hands from the end of February 2015 onwards. That there's been ample time in this period for the group, for Ronnie King, for officials, and for James Wharton, to have done a detailed consideration of what that research showed, and uh, you're given some sort of parliamentary update, or, or, or indeed given an, an update to, to the group, um, because they knew the research had been commissioned. So I would have thought their main concern should have been, rather than slagging off uh, a, 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 a departed minister, the, the concern really should have been, in December 2015, <clears throat> why isn't this review on track? The, re the work has been done. Whatever they thought of me, the evidence base had been handed over, and they'd had uh, seven months at this point to consider that evidence base. So I think this letter, Chairman, is... Well, I'm not going to give it much credence, because at this point they, they, they could have made a lot of progress, and it's for them to answer why they didn't. Well, have you read the rest of this letter? I well, you haven't shown it to me yet. <laughs> well, so you don't know, actually, what was in this letter, apart from the first paragraph I've read to you? No, I've no. never... Well, I, I won't have seen letters from no. um, uh, one MP to, to, to a subsequent minister. I mean, one of the issues in preparing for this one, I was asking questions uh, about it, is that... Uh, the, Officials were not uh, allowed to tell me what had happened. I mean, obviously, Chairman, when, when the fire happened, I, like everyone else, was absolutely horrified, but my horror was perhaps an informed horror because how could this happen, which everyone would have been asking. I was 
even more so asking how could this happen because because the building regulation should have been written and designed in such a way, as I've been told, that such a thing was impossible. But in any event, I did know that a review had been commissioned and at the point that I left office in March, May 2015, an evidence base existed for a revised document to be put into place. I mean, this is 18 months before, before the fire itself. Um, and I think it's not for me to criticise your questions, Mr. Millett, but for you, Chairman, but I think we should be more focused on that rather than what they thought of me. Right. I have a point to put to you. This is why I'm asking. It's right, isn't it, that these letters that you allowed your officials to write and which you signed and left out of the, let go out of the building were intended to be dismissive, given that your own officials had drafted them and that their approach, as we've seen, was that the APPG was something to be batted away. Well, well the, the, that particular phrase, of course, was in the email that I, I, I did say, Chairman, I was shocked to see. Um, so while I was aware, while I was in office, that there wasn't much mutual respect, I did not know that it had gone beyond that to mutual contempt, maybe? Which is the next stage beyond mutual, not having mutual respect. I, I, I didn't know that, and that's only become apparent to me uh, today and, and in oral evidence that you were taking last week. I'm, I'm really simply asking to, to what extent you are prepared to accept uh, that a feel, an expressed feeling of frustration over dismissive responses to well-founded and justifiable concerns, as said here, was justifiable. Do you accept any of that, or do you reject it? I think that they, they're quite within their rights to say that they felt they'd been <clears throat> dismissed. Uh, I would say that they were not dismissed out of hand. Um, they, they did get that meeting. They also met with um, Penny Mordant, who was the fire minister at the time, um, late in the second half of 2014. And I believe she held, held the government line, if, if I can put it that way, on, on the timetable and, and the issues that would be considered in the same way as I did. They've not chosen to stick the boot into her. Let's go back to your first statement, please. CLG 3030872, page 7, paragraph 24. You say there, Finally, I would like to note that on 3rd of March 2015, I confirmed the timetable for the review of approved document B in the Westminster Hall debate uh, called by Jonathan Evans, MP. Uh, uh, I said, following the Lacknell House fire to which my honourable friend referred, the coroner called on the government to simplify the guidance in approved document B of the building regulations. If you can go over the page, please. Uh, my Department Secretary of State committed a, to a review which will deliver a revised document in 2016 to 17. The intention is to simplify the guidance where possible and update and revise the technical content at the same time. My honourable friend mentioned sprinklers. They are recognised as highly effective fire protection measure. <coughs> it's too early to say how. <coughs> how uh, they will fit into the revised approved document but he should rest assured that the potential benefits will not be ignored. I'm not aware that there were any delays to the work during my time <clears throat> in the department. The ultimate responsibility for ensuring its completion lay with the Secretary of State, although the day-to-day -day responsibility will have rested with the building's regulation team. Now, uh, I've covered this before a little bit, Mr Williams, but let's just see if we can go through a, a focused list uh, of... Um, matters. Now, first, it's right, isn't it, that the seven work streams had not, or the, pub the reports on the seven work streams had not been published by the department in tw March 2015, had they? Uh, if you're telling me that's the case, then I've no reason to doubt you. They were published in February 2019. Did you know that? No, right. I'm, afraid, so, so, I'm afraid I didn't, and that does rather surprise me. Right. So when you got up uh, in Westminster Hall at this debate, did you know uh, that those seven work streams reports hadn't been published by the department? Or no. You didn't? No. Did you assume that they had? Um, I, I, Chairman, I already <coughs> said to you that this was a debate that I wasn't replying to in my own capacity as a minister. I was standing in for Penny Morden, so I, the, 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 
the amount of discussion we would have had about it was, was, was quite limited. But no, I did not know right. that the BRE research streams had not been published. Did you know whether any... Well, any other nor, nor do I know why, why, why they took as, took as long as 2019 to publish. It's, it, did you know that no other research on fire safety in high-rise buildings or any other of the matters set out in any of the coroner's recommendations had been commissioned? Uh, well, research had been commissioned in, um, I think it's July, isn't it, 2014? It's not at March, uh, to 20, no, not at March 2015. No, the research was commissioned in, in July 2014, I believe. What research was that? The, the research, the, the, the one and a half million pounds worth of research, what, whatever it was, across various uh, building regulations, but including Part B. We've all, we already discussed this this morning. There was a submission on, on the department's research budget for 2014-2015. Did you... Uh, at the time of this um, speech, this is, this is, this is March 2015. Yes, where had that got to? Well, I know now, because I've had to ask the question uh, subsequent to leaving office, that the research came back, I think I've already said this, Mr Chairman, on the record, uh, came back at the end of February 2015. Did you know that no usability study had been commissioned on Part B? I, I don't, I'm sorry, you're going to have to explain that question to me? Well, um, have you ever heard of a usability study? No. Right. Uh, did you know that no formal Part B working party had been established at this time? No. Did you find out? Did you ask? <laughs> Mr Chairman, we are going round and round here that well, can, can my, I... during my time as Minister, which you know, ended two weeks later from, from, this, from this comment, the, the research base had been commissioned. I know now, I didn't know <coughs> absolutely at that point, that it had come back and was with officials to be digested, as it were. So at that point, the evidence-based review of Part B was ready to go and would, would have been, I would have thought, a priority item for the subsequent government in which obviously I was not involved. I, I'm sorry if this is wearying you a little, and I know it's been a long day, but I'm just trying to get a shopping list together of things that had or hadn't been done and, I, I, and, what, and what you... Don't, don't worry about my feelings. So let's just see if we can say... So you don't know about the usability study. Um, uh, no formal... Take this from me, that there was no formal Part B working party established as at March 2015. Take that from me. Did you know that? No, but I guess you'd have to get into definitions about that. I mean, I had been told, because we, 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 we've talked about them, that preparatory work was underway. I'm not sure who would have been doing that preparatory work in the department. Maybe it was one person. Maybe it was only Brian Martin. But whether he was assisted by Louise Upton or Richard Harrell or other officials I never met, uh, I'm obviously not in a position to say. But given I was told preparatory work was underway, we've got two blocks of research, one from the BRE, one going out uh, commercially, as it were, in a bidding process. Um, why would I have assumed that, preparatory, that, that, that a team wasn't in place? I had no reason to doubt that there was. Uh, did you know whether uh, uh, any impact assessment had been done? That would not have been the appropriate point to do an impact assessment because a revised Part B had not been written. Hmm. You, you do an impact assessment, a government would do an impact assessment, a local authority would do an impact assessment when it is ready to go public, as it were, and it should uh, have in its impact uh, assessment the financial implications for business, the human rights implications and the equalities and diversity implications. All of those are, are legal requirements, I believe. But you're, obviously you don't make that impact assessment until you know what, what the new regulation is going to be at March 2015, which is the backstop date you're asking me about, what did I know? We were, you know, no draft of, no, no new draft of a, of a Part B could possibly have been made because the research had only just come back. And you knew presumably also that there'd been as yet no public consultation on any draft. Well, there couldn't be a public consultation on a draft that hadn't been drafted. No. So, uh, are you able just to, having got done through this exercise, just tell us in positive terms what had been done to progress the carrying out of the promise made by the Secretary of State to the coroner as at March 2015? 
I, I think um, three things have certainly uh, happened. Um, one is that the, the competent person scheme as regards window installers had been looked at in November 2013, and we've discussed that, although I accept you say she didn't necessarily ask for that, but it, it was it was a material issue, given, given that, that that was part of why, why the fire spread from one flat to the flat below. Um, research had been commissioned from the BRE. I did not know, um, it is you that has told me, uh, through you, Chairman, that that, um, that BRE seven uh, work streams had in fact been commissioned before the coroner's letter. Uh, other people will have to tell you, including the Secretary of State, who of course was, was in office either side of the coroner's letter, or was, I wasn't, um, whether that was to anticipate what the coroner might want the department to do, and that they knew internally that Part B needed to be revised. Um, so that was in progress, and the research um, into several uh, building regulations that I authorised in July, I think it is, 2014, was, had, had also been done. But, but I didn't know that had it been completed. I, I did not know that. And, and you know, those, I think those are reasonably substantial things. So, so, so progress, a lot of progress had been made um, by March 2015, but given that, however we interpret the 2016-2017 end date for the delivery of a new Part B, I, I, I think the grounds were well laid for that timetable <coughs> being met. Now you say in the second sentence of paragraph 25, the ultimate responsibility for ensuring its completion lay with the Secretary of State. Yep. Yes? Well, that's the case in any government department, yes. yes. Uh, although the day-to-day -day responsibility will have rested with the building regulations team. Yes. Now, the one person missing in that hierarchy you described there is you. Is it your evidence that you bore no responsibility? I don't think that's a fair characterization of what I've said to you in the course of today. And well, I just wonder whether you can help us why it is that you don't appear in that list. You've got the Secretary of State at the top with the Buildings Regulation Team with the day-to-day -day responsibility. The, where, is your, where is your responsibility? The, I've already... We're going round and round, but I've already said that delivery of a new document was not my responsibility, because it could not be my responsibility, given the timetable that had been set out by the Secretary of State. I'm guessing that's why I've, I've mentioned the Secretary of State there. But you, an approved document is a major regulatory uh, impact to be published by the government, and therefore ultimate responsibility lies partly with the Secretary of State. Perhaps it should have said there. But of course, given what I said earlier about the mechanics of, of government, it would have, it, other Secretaries of State and indeed, number ten in the treasury would would have had a view as well, but that you know that that would have come down the tracks, maybe in mid 2016, uh, with a right round uh, uh, approval stage. So the ultimate responsibility um, would not have, have rested with a junior minister, whoever that junior minister was, and the day to day, fairly obviously, uh, to make sure that things are on track and being been done professionally uh, does lie with the building regulations team, who are the professional staff engaged by the department, who are all still there, or mainly still there, um, uh, and what throughout was, this period. Right. And just taking paragraph 25, perhaps we can insert something then. So you've got the ultimate responsibility with the Secretary of State, the day-to-day -day responsibility with the building regulations team, the officials. Uh, could you just um, insert something Tell us what your responsibility was. Well, well, the first sentence does does start with I, Mr. Millet, through you, Chairman. Um, so I, I was not aware. I was generally not aware that there were any delays doing the work while I was a minister. So that that is a statement of my position, my <coughs> responsibility, my retrospect. Sorry, not, um, yeah, retrospective 
memory of what happened uh, at the time. Nobody said to me, this is off track. We need to do more. Um, uh, can we have more resources or, or whatever? Those, those conversations never happened. So if, if this answer 25 is to, you know, what, what, what was my feeling when I left office or my feeling when I left office is that I'd not been given uh, any information to lead me to believe that I was handing over um, suboptimal work. Would, would it be fair for us to understand that while, during your time as minister, which of course did not extend over the whole period for the review, your responsibility was to ensure that the work was progressed and kept up to speed? Yeah, yeah, yes, Chairman, that, that, that certainly is fair, and, and I, I think in response that it was yeah. up to speed at March 2015. I mean, the, there's a big gap in between March 2015 when the research comes back and the 2017 commencement date, wherever it is in 2017, that would have allowed plenty of time for officials to consider what that research says, to come to their own conclusions, to present that conclusion to um, James Wharton or Gavin Barwell, who I know you're seeing shortly, and to come up with some sort of agreement as to what, what they were going to do. Um, but, but that part of the chain, I, I was not involved with, and I knew I wasn't going to be involved in it. Now, um, can I then show you uh, the department's submissions made at the beginning of this module? <coughs> uh, these are written submissions to the inquiry. Can we go, please, to CLG 3036387? And if we go to page two, paragraph seven, it says this. Reflecting on its role in the issues to be examined in this module, the department continues to learn the lessons of the past and has conscientiously explored where its actions co contributed to an overarching building safety system that has subsequently been shown to be unfit for purpose with catastrophic consequences. Our work over the past few years has found that the department did not have a good understanding of how the regulatory system was working in practice, nor of how well it was being enforced. There was insufficient oversight of the system by government, and the right assurances were not sought. <coughs> now, clearly restricting your answer to the period, uh, the only period for which you can answer, namely the time you were a minister, Mr. Williams, do you agree with, paragraph, with that part of paragraph seven I've just read to you? So, sorry, I, I'm, I'm, I'm reading it again. Yes, take, take your time over it. Because obviously this is not my statement. I had no, no, no. I had no hand in uh, putting this together. Um, so the sentence, if this is what you're asking about, tell me if it's not, our work over the past few years has found the department did not have a good understanding. Is that in particular what you want me to comment on? Well, let's take it in stages. The first sentence, um, subsequently been shown to, un to be unfit for purpose with catastrophic consequences. Yes, but um, subsequently, I guess, is 2017, um, when, when, a new, when, when a new Part B was meant to have been in place. Yes, my question is, do you agree uh, on that sentence, uh, that the, the building safety system overseen by your department for the time you were overseeing it which has been shown to be unfit for purpose with catastrophic consequences. The, there were many building regulations, not just Part B, and while I was a minister, some of those parts were revised, and you know, I'm, I'm responsible for um, working with officials to... Uh, Achieve those 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 revisions or, or those um, interpretations, particularly in, in case of Part P with electrical safety. And so we were looking at access uh, as well. Those pieces of work were done while while I was a minister. That the catastrophic failure, which is obviously a reference to Part B. Um, you know, I don't know how many times I can say this, but in the period that I was in office, the department was working on coming up with a Part B. The first part of coming up with a new Part B is gathering the evidence, and that was done. Um, well, um, I, I don't know the date of this statement. I 
I guess it was uh, sometime last year. Um, but the point is that in 2015, it, is, it would have been a reasonable expectation of anybody that it was possible to deliver a new Part B according to the timetable that had been set out and reiterated repeatedly by the Secretary of State, by me, by other ministers you've talked to and ministers you, 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 that, that you haven't talked to as, as well. Um, so yes, that, that there were catastrophic consequences of a new Part B not being in place, possibly. But the point I'm trying to make, Chairman, is that as of May 2015, when I ceased to be a minister, um, I don't think it's fair to say that we were not addressing um, the risk that there would be a catastrophic consequence, because I think we were addressing it. Well, had anybody ever brought to your attention, I think I know the answer to this, but just help me, I mean, I, uh, the fact that um, the part of approved document B dealing with the com uh, use of combustible insulation over 18 metres uh, was unclear, open to interpretation, and misleading? No. 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 Um, I mean, I mean, Chairman, the, the, the the, the cladding and combustibility issue is something I you know, heard a lot more about since 2017 than I heard about in between 2013 and 2015, which was next to nothing. And looking at paragraph 7 a little bit lower down, it says, had the building regulations, British standards and statutory <coughs> guidance been followed and enforced with reasonable diligence, a large-scale cladding fire could not have happened. The department should have done more to take on board the learning and recommendations triggered by other fires, including the tragic events at Lackenal House, including exploring whether the system was working as intended. Similarly, correspondence, uh, if you turn the pages, turn the page to page three, please. I'll just pick it up at the, t at the top of the page there, Mr. Williams, including exploring whether the system was working as intended. Similarly, correspondence from the all-party parliamentary group on fire safety should have been addressed in a timelier manner, with more done to probe the issues raised by them. Now, is there anything in what I've just read to you from that paragraph there that you disagree with? I don't disagree with it, but t t timelier... It's an interesting word, isn't it? Um, g given I've said, Chairman, it was never clear what what David Amos and Ronnie King wanted in terms of timelier, um, or, or indeed Coroner, I, I believe, d didn't say that 2016, 2017 is not acting in a timely fashion, if I can put it that way. By the time I left office, a body of work a body of evidence was in place to enable a new Part B to be put in place, certainly in, in a timely fashion. So the timelier manner, I don't, you know, I'm not disagreeing with it, but I, I, I don't think is uh, a description that applies to the period that I was responsible for this area of policy. Um, what I don't understand, um, and haven't been told, is, is, is why given that position in, in May 2015, why a new document, whatever it said, and of course that, that's something, Chairman, we don't know. Um, I don't know what the evidence said. Uh, I don't know what officials would have made of the evidence that it said. I don't know what a minister would have made, subsequent minister would have made of that evidence. So yeah, we can't draw the conclusion that a new Part B address would have satisfactorily addressed everyone's concerns. We just don't know. Um, but I certainly couldn't have known that in, in May 2015. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Williams. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, I've come to the end of my examination of this witness, at least on what's uh, in front of me. There may be other questions I yes. should just go back over, because there are a number I haven't asked, uh, and just to see whether I need now really to do that and to see whether there are yeah. others that need to be asked from outside yes. us. All right, thank you. Well, Mr. Williams, at this stage in the proceedings, we have to have a short break, partly to enable counsel to check that he's not omitted anything, though you may think that's unlikely, and also to allow other people who are following the proceedings from elsewhere to suggest questions that perhaps we ought to be asking you. So we'll rise now. Uh, tw 20 to 5 going to give long enough, Mr. Minute.
Uh, yes, I think so. Right. Well, I say 20 to 5. If, if council needs longer, then uh, he can ask the usher to come and tell us. But we'll say 20 to 5 and then see if there are any more questions for you at that stage. All right. Would you go to the usher, please? <coughs> Right, Mr. Miller, 20 to 5 then, but if you need longer, will you ask the usher to come and do it? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, I will.
Would you ask Mr. Williams to come back in, please? <coughs> right, Mr. Williams, let's see if there are any more questions for you. Okay. Yes, Mr. yes just I think one or two. Um, Mr. Williams, you, you've given us some evidence earlier today about your, um, your role uh, in zero carbon homes. Yes. Yes. In that connection, did you ever uh, become familiar with the use of thermal insulation and the, and the products used uh, to make homes better insulated? Um, no, uh, is, is the answer to that. Obviously, I know that wall cladding is, is, it, it can be beneficial for, for insulation of properties and have seen uh, some being installed um, on, onto houses. It's, it's, it's an issue for the retrofitting of older houses in particular. We're not going to be able to tackle um, carbon emissions from homes if we don't retrofit the vast majority of our housing stock that was built you know, 100 or even 200 years ago, like Georgian houses, Victorian houses, or even houses right up until the 1970s that were very poorly insulated. Did you ever have cause to consider the relationship between the use of... of uh, combustible thermal insulation materials on the one hand for their thermal benefits uh, and their fire safety performance on the other? No, if, um, no, no, Chairman. Even, even though Rich, Rich, Richard Harrell was the official who I worked with most closely on drafting the zero carbon homes legislation, of course that, you know, that is actual legislation, it's in the Infrastructure Act, 2015 that I delivered, um, he, even though he'd also been in meetings with me that we've discussed today, he never made the crossover point to me that, of course, there could be an issue with this. So, so no, I, I, I didn't. It was more about energy loss from, from the buildings and other things that the house building industry could do uh, to make sure that uh, climate change is mitigated. Yes, thank you. Now, um, we've been through a lot of evidence together uh, today, and I'm very grateful to you for that. Looking back on that evidence and looking back on uh, all the material and your time uh, as minister, is there anything that you would have done differently? Um, the, the, I mean, that's a hindsight question, Chairman, and you know, this, is, this is, obviously I've thought about this, and it's, 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 a, it's a difficult question to say that if, if you're a politician, that your life can be littered with regrets to some extent because there were lots of things you invested time on that came to nothing, um, possibly as a Liberal Democrat, more exposed to that than a lot of people uh, in terms of what we were trying to uh, achieve. Um, so maybe I'm used to that. Um, and other issues that therefore I could have spent more time on. So I guess the direct answer, Chairman, is obviously now. Um, I wish I'd been able to push the timetable, at least to some extent, for, for a review of Part B while I was in office. But I don't think, I have thought about this very carefully, that there was ever any critical moment in time when I could have dragged the timetable forward to any material, to any material point that might have made a difference. As I've said a few times, the, the elapse of time in between when I was due to leave office, and that was a certainty, you know, one of the things that was a certainty in, in politics at this point was that the coalition was coming to an end, and the new Part B was quite a way off into the future, even if I had been able to pull that timetable back uh, a little bit, three months, say, six months maybe, um, I, I can't foresee what that Part B would have said. So uh, while, while I do wish um, I said to officials, is there any way we can speed this up, which is what David and Ronnie King were asking for, although they've never been quite clear, as I say, about what they wanted, um, I, I wish I had done that. But, but you know, I was working in, in an environment where it was very difficult for me to be reactive and reflective. It was a very... Um, uh, a time of period in my life when I've, I've never worked so hard. I wouldn't want anyone to get the impression that I'd been a lazy minister, a dilatory uh, minister. You know, I, I, I put into it everything I had uh, at the time, and there were lots of things that, with the help of department officials, 
I think we achieved and made it a, a, a quality difference to people's lives. Um, but I, I, while I regret the tone of some of what's been said, I think I was clear about that earlier, I, I don't think there is anything I could have done to materially make a difference to what happened in July 2017. Mm. Yes, thank you very much. Well, I've come to the end of my questions, Mr. Williams. It only remains for me to thank you very much for coming to the inquiry and helping us with our investigations. <clears throat> We're extremely grateful to you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Yes, and on behalf of the panel, Mr. Williams, I should thank you again. Um, <clears throat> it's very helpful for us to hear from uh, members of the government. It gives us an insight into the relationship between ministers and the department, which we shouldn't otherwise have the benefit of. So thank you very much for giving us a day of your time to answer questions. Uh, I hope it's not been too disagreeable, but anyway, it's over now and you're free to go. Thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Mellett. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Millett. That's certainly enough for today. It is. And we have another witness tomorrow morning. We do. We have, we have Lord <coughs> Barwell, who will be examined by Ms. Grange, Queen's Counsel. Good. Thank you very thank much. You. Well, then uh, we rise now and resume at 10 o'clock tomorrow, please. Thank you very much. <coughs>